Hello everyone, I'm Kathy Nash with the ACES staff and I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar which is entitled On the Duality of Metadata, Potential Uses and Abuses of Provenance Information. It's sponsored um, by DCMI. Our distinguished presenter is Amelia Acker from the University of Texas at Austin. She's going to be introduced by our moderator, Karen Wickett from the University of Illinois. I'd like to ask everyone in the audience to type your questions into the question panel box anytime during the presentation and they will be answered at the end during the question and answer period. Uh, the session is being recorded and the recording will be sent to all of you within 24 hours. I'm now going to turn the session over to Karen to introduce our speaker. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today and I'd like to thank our presenter Amelia Acker. Amelia is an associate professor at the University of Texas in the School of Information. She directs the MSIS program and leads the Critical Data Studies Lab. Currently, she is a fellow of the Governor Bill Daniel Professorship in Archival Enterprise and a recipient of the ACM History and Archiving Fellowship for 24-25. For Her research on data archives and preservation has been funded by the NSF and the IMLS. Amelia Acker's current research agenda focuses on cu cultures of mobile computing, emerging digital preservation models, data literacy, personal information management, and metadata standards for scientific data management. So um, she's going to present for a while, and then we should have time for discussion at the end. So as Kathy said, please put your questions into the question box, uh, and we'll go through them at the end. Uh, thank you again for coming, and I'm going to hand it off here to Amelia. Okay, hi, thank you, Karen. Um, and it's great to be with you all today. Um, I hope that we get to have a good conversation during the Q&A. Um, I also want to thank Kathy Nash and colleagues at ACES and DCMI for hosting the webinar series. It's an honor to be asked and to present and to speak with you all today. Before I uh, start my talk, I want to just take a moment and tell you about the place where I'm uh, calling you from. Uh, for the next two weeks or so, I'm going to be in New York City and I'm attending the Archives as Data workshop hosted by the History Lab at Columbia University and Columbia, Columbia Libraries. And it's sponsored by the NEH and we've been learning a lot about processing digitized textual documents as data, thinking about digitized text as metadata. Uh, Manhattan is part of the ancestral and traditional homeland of the Lenin, Lenape, and Wapinger people. So today I just want to take a moment and acknowledge that I'm meeting you uh, from indigenous land. And I want to invite each of you, wherever you're joining us from, to take a moment and acknowledge the indigenous people and lands where you are. So thank you. Okay, so um, a bit more about myself. Uh, Karen covered a little bit. I'm an information scientist. I trained and worked as a librarian and an archivist before uh, becoming a professor. Uh, now I sort of research um, uh, cultures of data and how we preserve and provide access to data collections over time. And over the past like 10 years or so, I've been studying how communities create data together. Um, with our mobile phones, with apps, with social media platforms, and how large-scale uh, technology uh, like wireless infrastructure bring those uh, data traces together, how they get collected, and then bound up to create digital cultural memory in uh, new spaces uh, like uh, information technology firms or in platforms. So today I'm going to speak to you about some of the sort of methodological approaches that I've been developing to study um, digital cultural memory, um, including how we might read metadata in web archives and in social media platforms and other kinds of so software driven environments um, where contemporary record keeping cultures are happening and where our records are not only born digital, but are born in networks. Um, this picture here on the right is a life event from the Obama White House that was posted in 2011. In 2016, I received early access to the Obama administration's social media data archive. And I've been really thinking about how institutions, state actors, 
and technology firms are increasingly overlapping in the records that we create, whether it's a presidential record, whether it's a social media post, um, whether it's news. So when Karen invited me to the webinar and she asked me to sort of cover metadata from a critical data studies perspective, I was really excited to maybe discuss a survey of my work um, in the area. So I'm going to be speaking about two examples of uh, metadata manipulation um, in social media platforms and across social media platforms. And I kind of want to talk to you about how manipulation um, can have tool impacts and how we might study it not only as um, uh, sort of disinformation campaigns, but also uh, signals to how our systems are changing and working. Um, and the idea here is that if we have a deeper understanding of metadata, if we can read it and understand provenance information more deeply, we can have not only a healthier information landscape, not just like as information professionals or as scholarly researchers, but also as citizen consumers of information and people using uh, new types of network technology. Okay, so um, here briefly is what the talk is about. There's a few points that I want to cover. Um, I, I don't think I need to define metadata too much, but I am going to cover it a little bit and also provenance information as well. I spent a little bit of time talking about social media metadata um, and metadata manipulation and how that is kind of unique to certain platform spaces. Um, for professional archivists, most accounts of metadata in the professional literature began with descriptive metadata in the early uh, beginnings of the web in 1990s. Um, but many information scholars have argued that uh, metadata has been present with us since antiquity um, amongst information cultures that keep records at scale. Um, I also want to spend a little bit of time of what metadata actually means to our culture, to our data culture in this particular moment, how we see it, how we use it, how we understand ourselves through it, and how it's um, uh, part of what uh, political economists call the platform capitalism um, uh, that underwrites most information technologies that we use today. So getting us to think about not just how metadata is important to our work, but also how our information scientists, archivists, library catalogs can anticipate sort of uh, changes and shifts with the rise and realities of platform capitalism in the face of disinformation, media manipulation, and the rise of AI content like deep fakes. Um, and then uh, there's this sort of second strand, which um, is kind of important uh, that I'm, I really want to emphasize, which is that increasingly, uh, not only the generation and access to metadata, but its enclosure by uh, platforms and corporate firms are increasingly epistemic marks of what it means to be a part of our data culture. So um, most metadata standards that we're uh, familiar with, that I teach in my classes, that we uh, work with and are part of data exchange are in the open, but increasingly uh, metadata and data integration is happening um, in closed corporate environments in ways that we need to be more uh, conscientious and considered and be thinking about quite critically, especially when it comes to misinformation. This brings me to um, some other considerations and caveats. And I just want to take a moment to comment on what researching manipulating social media means. I'm going to just present only two case studies and then a recent a uh, threat report from Microsoft Research that's about 10 days old. But I want us to be quite aware of the vintage of these case studies. Um, many disinformation uh, scholars talk about this, but um, one of the challenges of talking about manipulations, uh, influence operations, and um, subterfuge is that we may document or increase it. And so I, I'm quite aware that the misinformation examples that I'm going to be showing you are rather old, about 2018, 2019. Um, but we see versions of mimicking this legitimacy today. And uh, they're even harder to detect with some of the AI tools that are publicly available. The second thing that I want to talk about is this is not only going to be a survey of my work. It's going to be a big crowded table of many people that I really admire. So I'm going to take some moments and try to cite and uh, uh, draw attention to other critical information studies scholars, other archival science uh, researchers, and um, some contemporary work on scientific data management. Um, not, all the, not all of these researchers talk about metadata uh, specifically, but I think they have some really important uh, contributions for the ways that we think about 
um, metadata and significance of society today. today. Okay, so uh, what is metadata? What is provenance information? Before we start looking at manipulated metadata, I wanna just talk about what do I actually mean by metadata? Um, many critical data scholars tell us that data isn't just given to us, it's taken up, it's named, it's ordered, and it always has an intention or an ideology engendered in um, uh, it. And this influences the ways in which meaningful information and knowledge about different worlds, different people, different times, and different collections can be known. Um, increasingly, metadata is generated automatically and accessed by machines in automated contexts. And this has been the case for many decades now. Um, but importantly, one of the things that many uh, uh, metadata uh, applications uh, are dealing with is bringing together uh, uh, or migrating and reconciling um, ontologies and legacy systems. So um, that's, a, that's a really important part uh, about understanding metadata. It's often bringing together many different webs together and for example, like a watershed, if you will. Um, um, uh, many scholars have written about uh, metadata that uh, as it brings together more and more complex systems, higher rates of abstraction and hiddenness are, um, uh, are qualities of it. So it's harder to get at unless it breaks um, or is, um, uh, I don't know, has kinks in it, I guess. Um, uh, one of the ways in which I describe metadata is uh, that it's names that accrue interest. Um, and Gilliland talks about this phrase of interest and value in the Getty introductions, I think. But metadata are names and they're important because they identify things, not just things, but rules, conventions, and customs for how things come to exist and uh, govern our ability to access them. So representing stuff with names and categories is, fun is a fundamental uh, aspect of human identity and culture. And for many information scholars concerned with cultural memory and hegemony and systems of power, metadata applications such as classification schemas, information retrieval techniques, um, is really where the power of representation can be seen. So um, one of the things that I'm trying to do in this work and elsewhere is that in order for us to study the uh, big data systems in our lives or the datification of our culture um, is through the ways in which we represent data to ourselves and to uh, increasingly automated machine systems. Um, because these data structures represent uh, the context of collection, but also our context of, of access. Um, the term itself, I want to say, uh, started in the 1960s. There's a few debates on where it exactly it started, but um, according to scholars like Richard Gartner and his book on ancient to contemporary metadata, uh, 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 there are a few people that say that metadata techniques are what it means to be human. They're some of the oldest memory practices found in cultures of writing. Uh, they range from lists to receipts to taxonomies of the natural world. So they've been with us for um, many centuries, if you will. One of my favorite scholars and colleagues and collaborators is Matt Myernick, and he's made this point a couple of times um, in different places that metadata is often seen as a product, but it is also a process. Um, so often it can be an outcome or a goal of systems. For example, if you're processing an archival collection or you're maintaining a library catalog, but it can also um, uh, be processes for maybe connecting phone calls or sending emails. Um, increasingly, we see from science studies and people who study scientists, engineers, and other sort of formal knowledge practice workers, metadata also coordinates different types of stakeholders. And it also allows them, as they're coordinating complex tasks together, to ensure evidence and accountability for the work that they do. This is um, pretty important when we think about um, metadata manipulation, because when we're identifying when something's uh, uh, influence, uh, manipulation, subterfuge, or um, misleading, we might understand it. Is it exploiting metadata as a product? or is it exploiting metadata as a process? We might try and see how we see both in the examples uh, coming up. 
Another important part about metadata um, today is its social life. And I'm purposely drawing from Brown and Duguid's um, phrasing social life of, of information and of documents. When information architects design systems to sort of name, classify, and manage data, whether they're engineers or developers or librarians or archivists, um, metadata structures not only sort of the points of access for retrieval, but also the gateways for influencing our identity, our understanding, and the authority of what can be known. And um, uh, uh, scholars like Hope Olson and others, uh, Bowker and Starr, have both made the point that um, whenever we're enrolled into these systems of classification, they advance a particular type of worldview um, that's inherently political and biased. Not necessarily a bad thing, but the creators of these systems um, implement their own perspectives on how things should be. Here on the uh, right is a screenshot um, of when Facebook in 2015 changed their gender selection for users. Uh, in 20, 2006, when I first got on Facebook, there were only two options for gender, eventually three options. There was a radio dial. Um, eventually, it turned into a drop-down menu of five options, 17 options, 56 options. Then it turned into tags. And then in 2015, it became an open text field. I draw our attention to this because this is almost 10 years old. And um, we can see the power in designing such forms of enrolling users um, in terms of gender inclusivity and diversity and compare it to things like uh, Meta's real name policy, which requires users from having a which requires users to have a real name in order to be account users. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, this is not new. Um, all of us are participating in the social life of metadata and platforms, but um, it's important that we service that it's now sort of a banal part of existing and being a part of the web and also our social um, networks in society. Um, it's also important to remember that it's not just platforms that are making decisions and controlling um, subjectivities or identities and exerting power um, uh, uh, with metadata. For many years, uh, different historians have talked about how the state uh, uh, exerts rights to life and death over um, people using metadata. Um, after the Snowden leaks, CIA director Michael Hayden said that you know we killed we kill people, we kill terrorists based on metadata. So there are many histories um, during times of genocide and war where record keepers um, and those that govern metadata exert power over life. And so that's another thing that we wanna be aware of as we um, examine the social life of, of metadata. Um, something that um, my current work has turned to is thinking about how increasingly metadata products, features, workflows, and access points are uh, explicitly corporate business strategies. Um, so while deploying metadata standards um, uh, have historically been the domain of librarians and archivists and research data managers, it's really become more of the work of database designers, standards engineers, product managers uh, developing these new networked and platform tools. So with digital networks, users have sort of the potential to constantly create data that can be collected by corporations. They can bind it with different kinds of metadata and then resell that user data um, as part of their business model. Um, Morville writes about this in his Ambient Search book from about 10 years ago about how product taxonomies, brand architectures, and enterprise vocabularies are really in intimately connected to the strategy and competitive advantage of many of these data management and data integration platforms. Um, here I'm thinking things like Salesforce, uh, Tableau, Snowflake, and so on. So I think it's really worth taking a moment to say uh, most information technologies that we're using today, like the teleconferencing uh, platform that we're using, like the PowerPoint slides that I'm using that are licensed by my university, um, these uh, are capitalist in their design. Uh, they rely on data extraction, and as companies or these intermediaries, they use our personal data that we make together in order to continue um, uh, 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 their products. Um, uh, social media has been around for about two decades, and I think if you've started reading about your ad targeting bins or if you go into your privacy settings to look and see how these systems categorize you, you can easily see the worldviews and experiences and identity that's being put upon you. 
Um, but it's also like kind of fun. So here I have an example of Spotify Wrapped. Um, I'm a big Spotify user. I really enjoy uh, learning more about myself and my music listening habits um, at the end of the year. And so again, I don't mean to say that it's all um, bad and terrible and um, that these business strategies are actually a part of how we understand what we're doing when we're developing taste in music, for example, um, or listening to music together and having fun. Um, I do want to say one more time um, the the corporate business strategies that rely on um, gathering and uh, uh, using metadata for um, competitive advantage increasingly enclose and hide how that metadata is made. And I point you to um, two articles that I've uh, worked with with my colleague Andrea Liadis about Palantir, a uh, 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 data management surveillance platform, and how they use um, data ontologies or semantic ontologies as part of their um, product, uh, product and platform uh, capabilities. Okay. So um, what is metadata manipulation or media manipulation? I put this in um, curly brackets because the language around media manipulation has changed um, in the last like five or six years. Um, we could put in other words like misinformation, disinformation, malinformation, or um, things like influence campaigns. Um, but for me, um, one of the things that I'm trying to hypothesize when I encounter different types of disinformation or abuses of metadata is thinking about how metadata is um, uh, incorporated into those efforts. So um, this is a definition that I put forward with my colleague John Donovan in, um, and a special issue on data lockdown for researchers. Um, but we kind of put forth this hypothesis that if you're encountering a disinformation or a misinformation campaign or an information operation campaign, metadata in some meaningful way is being gamed, exploited, or drifting across platforms in ways that are kind of interesting and worth paying attention to. And this definition um, builds on earlier work um, with uh, Brad Fiddler and with Matt uh, Myronick, that um, there are many types of uh, large technical systems that kind of operate at all without metadata. Um, metadata is not just a byproduct of um, how uh, the system works, it is how the system works. Um, so uh, we just like we can read the ideology of social life um, uh, of metadata at work in platforms, we can also read uh, metadata at work through misinformation and disinformation when um, platform metadata types or categories or explicit uh, uh, standards get gamed and played around with. So um, based on uh, my research uh, sort of as uh, metadata as critical infrastructure and accessing um, uh, large scale social media data, um, I've really been interested in thinking about how can we look at the metadata standards to identify or to locate fingerprints of media, media manipulation and um, abuses. Okay. Um, I don't know how many folks are disinformation studies researchers or um, if this is why you're here, but one of the um, things that I try to bring um, to my colleagues um, at the School of Information and beyond is why metadata is so important to this sort of new field of disinformation studies. Um, it brings a lot of opportunities, and then there are also technical and methodological and epistemological challenges that I think are worth noting. But anyone who works with metadata day to day um, really can resonate with some of these um, points, I think. So um, one opportunity is uh, it gives us a really fine-tuned forensic way of setting virality or spread across audiences, um, uh, across platforms, sometimes called hopscotching. It also allows us to anticipate the way that new platform features are going to be uh, gamed or capitalized or how we might even think about um, governing them or creating policy around them when new features are rolled out. Um, it also allows us to think about public data literacy. So um, in a sort of different way, in a way that users are already familiar with. Um, so users are quite familiar with things like likes, follower accounts, um, comments and reactions and putting it into a frame of metadata um, is uh, really helpful to getting us thinking about um, how we uh, combat the harm of, of disinformation and media manipulation. There are many challenges uh, to this work um, and others have written uh, quite eloquently about that, but increasingly uh, disinformation researchers, um, especially in academia, uh, face 
uh, challenges to access because platforms are seen as increasingly private data. Um, there's high levels of uh, opacity from state and corporate um, uh, firms, uh, meaning that once we identify uh, this information, we may not want to share it. Um, and then there are also technical challenges and resource constraints. Uh, machine learning at scale creates a lot of digital haves and digital have-nots um, that we saw earlier in the 2010s with um, big data and computational science. Uh, for me personally, like as a researcher, access to the provenance information is a kind of an interesting and ethical question. It's a dilemma. Um, how do we want to document uh, this subterfuge, this manipulation? How do we want to learn from it? And do we want to automate it or do we want um, humans to witness it in different ways? So what are the uh, administrative and access privileges? Um, the another big challenge is that platforms are always new they're always uh, rolling out new features and so there's less access for researchers as there are increasingly more opportunities for um, influence and uh, manipulation and then the last one is that metadata is kind of boring sometimes um, uh, occasionally people will say why would i why would i want to look at these standards or what's interesting about that and so um uh, thinking about metadata as rich and exciting can be um, a challenge um, uh, for some of uh, some of my research like this. In 2018, I uh, worked on a report at the Data and Society Research Institute where we looked at uh, misinformation campaigns and media manipulation and happening on platforms during the midterm elections. And I put forward this um, idea of data craft, um, this uh, definition that practices that are really creating, relying, or playing with the data that's moving around um, and engaging with uh, new computational and algorithmic mechanisms of organization and classification. And I want to submit to you today that um, data craft has only gotten uh, more um, uh, playful and pro and uh, expansive as we've seen more and more AI tools spread into the public. Um, I want to be careful and signal that data craft is not always bad um, and it doesn't always lead to, um, you know, uh, a subterfuge or um, state sponsored uh, uh, election uh, uh, misinformation campaigns. We can see lots of different forms of creativity, savviness and um, what other uh, people who study hackers call this sort of a deep knowledge of the systems uh, to bring that craft to um, playing and working with data. So we might think about different ways where we've been crafty with our own data and uh, how we see that as a kind of skill or um, expertise. Um, so this image is from the report and uh, the colors actually do kind of matter here. The content is what users typically post in red, um, uh, but the metadata um, is the purple um, uh, images from the social media metadata. And craft um, here, when I'm talking about craft work, it's any work that's supplemental, material, and skillful. And uh, so for disinformation campaigns or for influence operations or for metadata manipulation in particular, uh, we're now seeing uh, folks evading automated detection systems or automated content moderation, or at least trying to. And it's clear that um, some manipulators or bad actors are craftier than others. Uh, some clumsy manipulators leave obvious spammy signals or other kinds of fingerprints that reveal them to be untrustworthy very easily. Um, while others, it's actually quite hard. It's like a chameleon. Um, but uh, in the 2016 election meddling investigations that we saw, there were lots of different types of uh, fingerprints uh, or noisy signals of uh, uh, signals activity of bad actors, such as paying for ads in rubles, uh, geolocation tags from outside the US um, that are only accessible to third parties. Um, uh, that can access data through APIs. And um, unfortunately, since then, since 2016, our ability as researchers and outside um, observers to access these types of metadata um, are, have, been, have been increasingly um, pulled back and curated by the platforms themselves. Um, I also wanna say that um, one thing that I, I think is a mark of uh, data craft today is that um, they out, outmaneuver automated moderation tools by mimicking real human behavior on the surface. 
And if anyone's logged into a social media site from their mobile web browser recently, you might have gotten a warning that says, this looks like automated behavior. And um, when the system is telling you this looks like spammy behavior, it means that the system itself is changing for what it means to be sort of a human regular signals behavior. And so that's quite interesting and we're seeing it unfold right now. Okay, so this is one of the um, first uh, pieces of uh, metadata manipulation that I'm going to share. Um, it comes from the original Data Society report and it's mimicking legitimacy to users. Um, uh, this is Representative Brian Babin um, um, from the state of Texas. What we found in 2018 was that most state representatives had these uh, dual accounts, sometimes three copy accounts. Uh, they looked official, they mimicked legitimacy, and they often had the exact same uh, photos, tags, um, followers, and posts. Um, one of the interesting things that we learned in our studies um, is that oftentimes the official accounts had things that did actually look less official. Um, so on the right here are documents from PowerPoint presentations, and this is indeed the official account. Since then, both these accounts have become banned on Instagram and uh, Representative Babin has a, an official account. I looked this morning, a lot more followers uh, since 2018. Um, but it's interesting to see that uh, this is one way that we see metadata manipulation. The content is fully taken, but the metadata is almost cloned um, in really interesting ways. One of the things that we developed in the report as we develop, as we came, as we began to forensically analyze these different examples was um, steps that people can use for reading metadata. And I encourage you to go check out the report. Um, uh, people who are extremely online already do this already, um, but it's helpful to look at things like account names, uh, recycled images, to do reverse image search, to look at tags, um, follower accounts, and what uh, is increasingly called authentic interaction. And uh, people uh, build different um, ideas or senses of what authentic interaction is the more and more they are online. Um, I think this is like a panacea and a cure uh, or poison and a cure because um, the more you're online, the more you might read uh, 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 inaccurate signals and the less you're online, you may be uh, less exposed. Um, so it's an interesting um, feedback loop. Another example of um, uh, sorry, uh, manipulation uh, that my lab studied in 2020 um, after the COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemic started uh, was examples of automated moderation being circumvented by users themselves. Um, and we found this uh, in provenance information that's published by the Wayback Machine and their data about Save Page Now. Um, I want to give a special shout out to Michael Nelson and his lab at um, Old Dominion University, who's done a lot of work on the weaponization of web archives. Um, it's, this work was really uh, uh, inspired by um, his prior work um, in particular. So what we basically found was um, uh, uh, people were beginning to use the Wayback Machine and the Save Page Now feature as a way to mimic the legitimacy of URLs as platforms increase their content moderation um, features and fact checking. Let's see what it looked like. On the left here, um, if you shared a, a URL that had been fact checked by a mainstream non-biased fact checking organization, um, uh, uh, Facebook would put up these little banners that say you're about to share um, some uh, false information that's been proven um, wrong. Um, so what we found in the provenance information from the Wayback Machine on, on uh, many of these URLs of the Millennium Report um, was that people would go and uh, save page now or archive the um, misinformation at the Internet Archive in order to freely post it on Facebook. And what we found was that the original um, URL as compared to the web archived URL um, uh, was uh, consumed, was engaged with, was seen about half the time as the legitimate um, uh, URL uh, from the Wayback Machine. We had some conversations with um, Mark Graham, um, who's the head of the Wayback Machine, um, and he's done some amazing work with creating um, what they call yellow context banners. 
Um, and so now um, if there is a fact check misinformation that has been stored um, in the Wayback Machine, um, there's this yellow banner that says uh, this has been fact checked as misinformation. Um, there is a lot of um, research about the labeling effects of fact checks like this um, uh, and the differences in trust between uh, people fact checkers and algorithmic fact checkers. But I think this strategy of saving page now and using the Wayback Machine to share misinformation um, speaks to how people are responding to automated content um, in particular. So we have this idea about safe URLs for users um, in, in, in contradiction or in comparison to the safe URLs that the content moderation uh, strategies uh, flag. Um, many historians have uh, raised this issue of what the yellow context banner actually does and what are we doing when we flag misinformation and how do we historicize that appropriately? Um, because the impact of um, the, these layers of context banners on the original web archive uh, from fact checking tells us about another history of how um, platforms, firms, and news organizations face disinformation in this moment. Um, and then um, uh, I should say up front that this yellow flag only appears if you go to the Wayback URL. It doesn't appear um, when it's embedded elsewhere. Um, and it doesn't appear when it is hopscotched or moved around. So there are limits to these types of flags or content moderation um, features, um, especially in encrypted messaging apps like WhatsApp um, and em embedded hyperlinking, which is where many platforms are moving to. Okay, I'm just uh, wrapping up like as quickly as I can, um, but uh, the this is the third uh, misinformation or disinformation campaign that I'm going to talk about. It's instead of being uh, f four years old, five years old, uh, this is from last week. Uh, last week, uh, Microsoft Threat Analysis Center reported on uh, Russian influence operations for violence, reported violence uh, at the Paris Olympics. So they are um, flagging and finding videos, images, um, ads, and um, other kinds of automated generated content that are um, falsely saying there will be violence planned at the Olympics. Um, Microsoft uh, says that this uh, content has been generated by automated bots and that it appears across many different platforms um, and that they are assessing it as artificially generated and also artificially spread. So a big difference between the misinformation um, that I showed you from 2018 and 2020 and today is that increasingly we're seeing more automated content created by AI tools. Um, uh, the good news or the duality of this is that um, threat teams like Microsoft are assessing and are able to authenticate it being AI generated by um, uh, uh, metadata uh, to begin with. Um, but an issue for us as researchers um, and as consumers of information is how do we make sense of this missing data? It's true, archives have always had silences, we've always had missing data, but increasingly um, as we see these AI disinformation campaigns uh, ratchet up, uh, we're also seeing them disappear. So what are the ways in which we should be thinking about the social life of this manipulated metadata and how might we not only track it, identify it, and publicize it, but also how will we remember it in the future. Um, provenance information is one way that uh, uh, we can do this. Um, provenance information is a type of metadata that typically describes the uh, hands or the processes for which an information object has moved over time. Um, so for example, the um, Internet Archive and the Wayback Machine now include these yellow context patterns. Um, uh, let's see here. I think I went back. Okay. Sorry. Forgive me. <laughs> um, so let's talk about um, the future of uh, information provenance. So increasingly, we are seeing um, efforts um, in uh, philanthropy, uh, federally funded science research organizations, and in corporate efforts to think about how we can develop automated workflows and machine actionable data management that relies on provenance information. So there are a few um, 
uh, new things that are uh, uh, worth exploring and learning more about. If you want to learn more about it, I can share with you. But recently, the AI Elections Accord was signed by a bunch of different uh, tech corporations, um, all agreeing to mitigate the risks of deceptive AI uh, using robust pro provenance methods that rely on um, uh, 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 provenance data. Um, uh, the AI election Accord is connected to the Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity. That was started about two years ago. Um, it's an industry uh, standard for certifying digital media. This is the image here. Um, you can see the last back of it is the provenance data that is will be embedded into these objects so it can travel along. Um, there are a number of uh, legislative acts that increasingly discuss uh, research data management and the ability to access data uh, immediately and also um, with machines. Um, so actionable data management that relies on provenance mechanisms. Um, there's also a new um, cyber infrastructure uh, for public access and open science uh, uh, call at NSF. Uh, really thinking about how do we catalyze research data management um, for AI computing uh, utilities. And then, and then um, from researchers themselves, we're beginning to see people talk about um, scientific data reuse as an area for us to think about uh, the potentials for provenance information, especially with um, scientific data misuse and the training and concerns that scientists have about how their data is accessed in the future. So um, Borgman and Groth, uh, Groth uh, developed the PROV uh, uh, standard model. Um, they have this new article um, called From Creators to Reusers, where they talk about the distances between what it means to create data and who is reusing it and how. Um, and then Arena Pescato from um, UMD is also doing some work on scientific data misuse and how do we understand and apprehend the rise of that. Um, uh, just a plug, we're going to have a uh, ACIS um, a panel in October on this exact uh, topic. And so I welcome you to come to that. Um, so I wanted to leave enough time for us to have a discussion, um, but I wanna thank you for attending. Um, before we jump into the q and A, I I wanna thank um, some institutions and collaborators. Uh, this work over the past couple of years has been supported by the Institute for Museum and Library Services, the National Science Foundation, uh, the Sloan and Ford Foundations, um, and UT Austin School of Information. Um, I also want to thank uh, all of my collaborators and students have worked on a lot of this stuff over the years. As you saw, many of it was uh, during COVID, and um, it was really great to continue researching and doing this work um, when we were um, at a distance. I want to thank uh, Mitch and Lucy, um, Akil, um, and my postdoc, Sarika, as well. Um, anyway, thank you for attending, and I'm really excited to hear your thoughts on uh, the duality of metadata and the potentials for provenance information research. I will open it up for a Q&A. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Amelia. This is really great, really interesting. Uh, so we have, I have a, a few questions already. Uh, so uh, we'll start with this one from uh, Owen King, wondering about the definition of media manipulation and why it's formulated in passive voice, uh, e.g. metadata are gained. Do you think sometimes the metadata can be gained without there being an identifiable agent of manipulation? That's a really great question, Owen. So um, the quote is directly drawn from the report for Data and Society. But you make this good point about temporality and um, and assigning like evidence or accountability. I do think that media manipulation can be ongoing and it can also have like trickle down effects. So one of the things that we found in the web archiving or the weaponization of web archives is that um, often there were second order layers, so true information buried in uh, misinformation and wrapped up. Speaks to this point of like moving through time. Ma manipulation doesn't happen just one time. Um, it can happen and spread over many different like places or contexts. I think that's why um, the provenance information and building a language for understanding sourcing, context, and retrieval is really important. 
um, uh, even if it's constrained by the platforms that we use, for example. Thank you for the question, Owen. Thanks. We have a question from Grisel Rodriguez, and I have kind of a little bit of an additional question with this. Uh, so uh, Grisel asks, is the Microsoft threat analysis using their own AI to detect other automatic AI? If so, what are your thoughts? And then I wondered also if you could just talk a little bit about how uh, metadata is used. You mentioned metadata being used to detect automatically generated content. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about the, the, the mechanism. For yeah, that. that's, that's great. So um, I don't have any special knowledge into the Microsoft Research Threat Group but I would imagine that they do use their own products and services. It'd be interesting to ask colleagues there, are they using and making use of open AI tools? Um, since uh, Microsoft is a big stakeholder there, um, I know that OpenAI announced the CP2A commitment uh, and sign on to the AI elections accord. So I, um, I presume that increasingly this standard is being incorporated and used as part of their identification mechanisms. Um, uh, to Karen's question about like how is uh, misinformation metadata um, identified and how is it used, it's often used in many of the techniques that um, open source investigators use timing, uh, uh, exits, so it kind of depends on the content, right? But looking at uh, uh, faces, jitter, skew, um, when it's originated, and then oftentimes uh, automation techniques uh, are running through classifications or patterns, so pattern recognition is another way that it's identified. Um, if you write me an email, Griselda, I can send you some more like technical documentation and some reports on this. Um, uh, I don't have them on hand right now because I have a small screen, um, but I would be very happy to share more information about that. And there's a lot of research happening in um, computer science and computer security that is developing these new techniques, leveraging um, automated, automatically generated metadata. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question from Adrian Canino that says the challenge of corporations using closed metadata standards is really interesting slash scary. Are there examples from history of how open metadata standards have become the accepted practice? And I guess I, again, I have another little add on if I can, which is just if you could talk more, a little bit more about, you mentioned kind of hiddenness of metadata in these platforms. Uh, so if you could give some examples of that hiddenness and, and there's kind of an interesting question here of like open standards versus available metadata or open kind of like is the standard open versus is the metadata actually readable to, to whom? Yeah, those are, that's a lot of great questions. So <laughs> a historic example of a corporate a standard becoming an open standard that's really great is PDF. Um, created originally by Adobe and now there's a PDF like standards organization and PDF is like a uh, PFA is our archival format of choice. Um, so um, there are format examples uh, that come from corporations or uh, uh, corporate professional bodies um, another example might be MP3. Jonathan Stern has a really cool book about that. Those are both format um, standards, but they're worth talking about in terms of the metadata they can and can't collect. Um, in terms of hiddenness, um, uh, this is an important uh, distinction and we didn't get deep enough into it, but hiddenness often has to do with the complexity and embeddedness of the systems that the data is being moved around in. So that could include things like software, hardware, and operating system. Um, so my work as an administrator, I have to sign a lot of forms, and it's important to us that I, my signature is the last signature on the PDF. There are certain types of softwares that allow students to grab a signature from one area and put it into another. 
and the metadata reveals that it's not an authentic document. We need to, because of our business processes, make sure that certain signatures happen in a particular order. Um, does it matter on its face at the end of the day? It probably does, <laughs> but there are some ways that um, the software that you use to access the data or to access the format can hide it uh, or make it easy to edit. I don't want to say like manipulation isn't necessarily bad. Like if you've done any data cleaning, data wrangling, manipulation is great. <laughs> um, we need to clean up our data. Um, but we also need to have some um, rules, regulations, and documentation about authenticity and uh, what we're working with. And Karen, to your point about the hiddenness, like it's really hard to get some of these documents about um, data standards in some of our systems. We, they surface online for a little bit and then they disappear and they get updated. Uh, one of my favorites is the Salesforce uh, data dictionary. It's like hundreds of pages long and it tells us how expensive this amazing um, uh, uh, system is. Um, can you imagine what the data dictionary looks like for Canvas or some of our learning management systems? I've never been able to get access to it, even though I'm subject to using it all the time. So I often think that there's documentation standards that we expect from our open metadata standards, especially for early open web uh, data transmission, that we should begin to demand from the platforms that we use. Any Thank other you. questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, um, so we have a question from uh, Travis Wagner, who says, this is a wonderful talk, Amelia. Thank you so much. I would like to second that. I was wondering if you could speak more about what users think they are doing with metadata production and what actually happens to that metadata at a system or corporate level. In particular, I'm thinking about the Facebook gender identity example. While they certainly offered more gender options, it is likely those identity categories are getting reconflated at a back end level. Any thoughts on how to make this process more transparent or show users what actually happens with something like demographic metadata in the systems they use? That's a really good point, Travis. Thank you for the question. So um, I think that this is actually an area that information scholars need to begin to think about. Mayernick makes this point in one of his articles that there's um, uh, engineering documentation about how metadata standards work in our technical systems. There's uh, academic literature about how metadata works in uh, institutions, in scientific firms, in places where knowledge and facts get made. But there really isn't that much work on what it means to make metadata now. And one of the things that I'm trying to say, and I think to your point, is like, it's happening all the time when we're doing it. This is what it means to be in our society now. So we actually do need to gather more um, information, qualitative research from people about what they think they're doing when they're disclosing, when they're identifying, when they're becoming members, when they're using these things. We see a lot of this in um, literature from CSCW, I think. But I think the next layer um, is how do we get um, access to or how do we understand how developers, product managers, engineers who develop these tools and use this data make sense of it. You know, many of my students go and work for these organizations, Facebook, Netflix, HBO, and they often just work on one little button. So they don't always think about or know how that user data is getting moved around. And so I really do think we need to develop some new methods or new approaches to understanding firms and how they are using our data in different ways. And one of the coolest things that I've seen is in the UK, you can, or in the EU, you can ask a firms for all the data about you, and then you can learn about how they understand you. And I actually think that that might be like, an activist way that we can turn the inside out and understand how corporate firms understand the facts that we give them and how they make the facts about us based on the data that we're disclosing. Because you're totally right, the data that I'm using to identify myself may not be uh, used to identify me in an ad category or a demographic category, for example. So thank you for the important question, Travis. Thank you. Okay, let's see. All right, so we have a question from Ying Yang Han. Uh, as you mentioned, metadata can be boring and technical. 
My question is, how do we engage with marginalized communities to make them aware of the importance and potential manipulation of metadata? Do you have some recommended articles on how metadata ed on metadata education in community? That's a really great question. Um, the, there are two um, areas that I think are really cool to think about and think with. Um, uh, black feminist scholars have been talking about how uh, uh, women, black folk, different types of bodies are represented and how they are made accessible in open access regimes uh, for many years. And um, one great place to start would be Tanya Sutherland's new book, Resurrecting the Black Body. Um, she has this great chapter in there about appropriate access and talking through um, what uh, building an appropriate access point for digitized collections might be um, based on um, how a community accesses it and how an institution provides access based on their top-down open access policy. There's a lot of um, indigenous scholars who've talked about IDSOV, um, which is a standard that helps us think about care principles. So one of the fields in Dublin Core is intellectual property. And it assumes a single author, it assumes a single owner, it doesn't assume a network or community of people. So, so there's some readings about that. One of my favorite um, uh, places to dig deep is um, the early 2010s uh, conference talks uh, from places like Code for Live, Lita, and so on. Um, Maria Matienzo has a talk called um, the, I think it's like the path to linked open data is, is uh, the hell of good intentions or something. I'm totally not saying that, but it's it, it talks about how this regime of open access at uh, top down doesn't account for our ability to change and um, provides a couple of other, these pointer examples of communities saying, we do want to have uh, what we call today data sovereignty or rights and ownership over how our data is um, represented. And then finally, um, it's not explicitly about metadata, but it's about how communities understand data tooling. I'm really, um, uh, I really love teaching with and learning from Roderick Crooks's work. Um, he has this really cool piece in a learning sciences journal about the representationalism of students in um, data systems. And so that's another thing I think is really important is thinking about how students um, are datafied, enrolled in data regimes um, as young people, learners, and readers um, when they start going to school. Um, if you send me more email, um, email I'll send you some um, more suggestions too. Thank you for the question. Oops. Okay. Uh, let's see. We've got about two minutes left. These are Great questions. Thank you, anyone. Um, let's see. Yeah, well, this is kind of a big one. Uh, so Rebecca Daly asks, how do we push back against the narrative of if you don't accept AI, you will become obsolete? It feels like a threat. What do you think, Amelia? Oh, boy. Thank you for the question. Um, my uh, president at UT just announced that this year is the year of AI. And um, there's a prevalent um, techno solutionism, as um, some of my colleagues are calling it, where it's just like going to be water and air. Um, I'm aware that uh, we're in a history of computing. And so like in the 1990s, the question is, is your computer connected to the internet? <laughs> and now it's, is your, I don't know, is your phone AI? So I think that we should just have a little bit more nuance and assume that AI will be baked in, if it isn't already, to most of our tools um, and that we spend more time uh, servicing why we need it, what are the resources, what's it used for. Um, so for example, my own institution, they just rolled out Copilot and a couple of other learning tools and we can't opt out so I'm trying to gather documentation and to learn more about like, well, what, what does this mean? <laughs> how, is, how is my student's data being enrolled? But can I renunciate or refuse? Um, am I in a position of power to refuse? Am I in a position of, of um, privilege to refuse? Like who can say no? 
And um, I think just being critical about it and saying it um, is probably one step in the right direction. But it's true, like, the techno solutionism um, um, is really rampant and, I don't know, tedious. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely agree, right, that um, thinking about new ways to be critical is really important as we see these new uses for these technologies. So I think this, I'm, I'm a big believer in this idea of reading metadata, so thank you for talking about that today. And we are, we just hit our timer uh, limit, so thank you so much for this talk and thank you everyone for attending and for your great questions. Uh, as Kathy said, this recording will be available. And if you have more questions for Amelia, uh, I think her contact information is available and she can um, take questions over email in the future. Thank yeah, you. Thank everybody. you, Amelia. Thank you, Karen. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you all. I appreciate it. I appreciate all everybody that attended. And be sure to check your spam folder uh, tomorrow because you will receive within 24 hours the recording. Um, from today and you're also going to receive a survey and I ask you to please um, fill the survey out. It's really important for our future planning. Again, I'm Kathy Nash with the ACES staff and I thank all of you for attending. I thank Amelia for her wonderful presentation and Karen for moderating. Thank you. Have a good day.